A massive protest over frozen bank deposits turned violent in Zhengzhou in China. Four rural lenders in the northern province of Henan froze the deposits of hundreds of thousands of customers. Guess what the government did? Unleashed military tanks. <laughs> All right, guys, we have got to talk about what's going on with China. If you've been paying any attention to international news or YouTube finance, you might have noticed a new trend of articles and videos on China's countdown towards economic collapse. Well, in today's video, I want to explain why this topic is becoming so popular and why you as an individual might be affected. Yes, you heard me right. If China's economy actually collapses, it will be devastating for the entire world, including you on a personal level. And what most fail to realize is how much the U.S. relies on China in such a like symbiotic relationship. A China slowdown will affect the U.S. in four main areas, trade, the U.S. debt, the value of the U.S. dollar, and smashing the like button for the YouTube algorithm, as doing this might literally help save our economy as well as China's. But also guys, this helps YouTube and I know that you want to see more videos like this. But back to what I was saying, in recent times, China has been taking center stage with dozens of articles, all over the internet covering stories about massive protests, thousands of personal bank accounts being frozen, strict COVID lockdowns, and major home developers defaulting on their loans. But what is really tipping the scale for China's economy is the recent surge in mortgage boycotts and China's real estate sector. Now I know the US is having a crazy housing market, especially in places like where I live, in Florida and Long Island, but it still only makes up about 16.4% of the US GDP. This is only a sliver compared to China. Real estate makes up about one third of China's GDP and housing accounts for about 70% of household wealth, making it one of the most important investments for most Chinese people. Now, during the 2020 lockdowns, China had rising concerns about their property market potentially rising too fast. And what was starting to happen is more and more people were buying apartments before they were actually built. Now, this influx in real estate companies using funds from current homeowners to leverage and build previous projects was growing out of control. Now, doesn't this sound a lot like a pyramid scheme? I mean, just think about it for a second. That's the exact definition, a form of investment in which each paying participant recruits two other participants with returns being given to early participants using the money contributed by the later ones. So in this case, recruiters pre-sold new apartment complexes to pay for the older ones. Now, this usually is a very tight rope to be walking on, and even the slightest change in structure could make the whole thing crumble like we're seeing today. In response, China started to actually tighten their policies around excessive borrowing by real estate developers, and that's all the real estate market needed to make the whole thing crumble. These policies aren't new though. The Chinese government had been making regulatory changes since 2017 to slow down the crazy inflated prices, but the final blow came in August of 2020 when China's central bank announced a strict three red lines policy, imposing limits on the ratios of developers' debts to its cash, uh, then you had equity and even assets. Almost immediately, the real estate sector had a liquidity crisis as real estate developers could no longer rely on easily accessible debt to continue their construction projects. Real estate developers like Evergrande, which is one of the largest companies in China, as well as many others, started to default on their loans. Now they have amassed about 300 billion in debt. Now this led to a chain reaction across the country, putting business that rely solely off Evergrande into a financial crisis. Things like construction and uh, manufacturing and even like landscaping that do these specific projects that rely solely on Evergrande's business are now in a financial struggle. For decades, real estate developers in China never had to worry about income for their projects. And about 90% of new homes are pre-sold in China. New homeowners would literally leave deposits and make mortgage payments purely based on photographs and model structures months before their apartment was built, which is something that honestly I haven't heard of that much in the US, but I do know it's happening a lot here in Florida where people are buying homes prior to them actually going to market, which is, it's crazy to me. But with this new construction now being delayed or even forced to stop, homeowners actually began to take notice that no one was working on their apartments when they walked by and not getting the answers that they wanted when they called the developers, boycotts by the hundreds of thousands started to break out and more 
mortgages on future homes started to go unpaid. Now remember, real estate in China makes up about one third of their GDP. That is huge. But what gets crazier is the spark that really started China's economic collapse began with a 590 word letter written by angry purchasers of the half-built dynasty mansion project whose pleas for China Evergrande Group to complete homes they'd long been paying for had fallen on deaf ears. Now all home buyers with outstanding mortgage loans will stop paying unless construction resumes before October 20th of 2021, they threatened. This spread like wildfire across China, even with their local government suppressing and banning this information. Within four weeks, more than 320 projects in about 100 cities were facing similar protests, angering markets and forcing authorities to pressure banks and developers to defuse the unrest. With Evergrande and many other real estate developers failing to meet the deadline, homeowners stopped paying their mortgage. This carries huge risk for homeowners in China as defaulting on loans will limit an individual's ability to travel, get their children into school, and borrow from banks in the future. But it was a risk they were willing to take. And this mortgage boycott movement has truly shown that common Chinese citizens are now miserable enough to defy ironclad rules enforced by the government and their president. With construction stopping on around 13 million apartments during the past year alone, over $220 billion in mortgage loans started to go unpaid. With the boycotts growing larger and larger every day, this vicious cycle of already struggling developers will become even more desperate for cash. The Chinese property market collapse is now so vast and extreme that property companies are actually demolishing entire cities of half-finished buildings. It's absolutely mind-blowing to see this. China's government has even already stepped in, urging banks to extend loans to property developers so that they can finish the construction and get everything back to what could be normal, as this might literally be the only way to stop these boycotts and get people to start paying their mortgages again. But honestly, in all reality, the damage to China's economy has already been done. China's property sales will likely drop by about 30% this year, nearly two times worse than their prior forecast. And such a drop would be worse than in 2008 when sales fell by roughly 20%. This also came at the absolute worst time for China. Besides mortgage protests, people are gathering in the streets by the hundreds to protest some of China's central banks. Turns out there was a massive financial scam in central China, leaving people locked out of their bank accounts, unable to withdraw their money. Hundreds of thousands of people placed their life savings in four rural banks, offering high rates of return. When investigators began examining allegations of widespread fraud, the depositors discovered that their funds had been frozen and unavailable for withdrawal. What people keep forgetting about China is they are still under lockdown, one of the strictest at that too. There is also a zero tolerance policy in place. And this means at most one virus case can lock down a city of millions of people for weeks at end, causing many people to be out of work for an extended period of time, and also coincidentally shutting down protests and, you know, ruining their economy by not having people in the workforce. You see, in China, there has been a new system enforced on all citizens, which is mind-blowing. It's actually an app that gives citizens a color code. Green, you are good to go and travel and be out in public. Yellow, meaning that you may need to stay home for a week or two, and red means you must be quarantined for two weeks. And if you don't follow the rules, this app actually sends your personal data and location directly to the police, and you know what happens next if you don't abide. Now, it's almost impossible to be out in public or travel without getting asked at, you know, bus stops or railway stations or even at the supermarket to show your code color in order to get access. Turns out when bank customers began showing up to demand their money and protest, the authorities used that health code app meant to prevent the spread to prevent new protesters from actually traveling traveling to the destination, turning their color from green to red and forcing people to stay at home. Now, as for the people that were already protesting, authorities sent guards to defuse the protesting and many were actually beaten and sent to the hospital. This Henan bank scandal truly highlights the growing concerns over China's more than 300 high-risk local banks, adding to the lessening trust in a key sector of China's economy. So what exactly has all this done to China's economy and how will this affect ours personally? Well. 
Let me start by saying this has caused the youth unemployment rate in China to hit a record high of 19.3% in June of 2022, much worse than in previous graduation seasons. And in March, an estimated 345 million people across 46 cities were in full or partial lockdowns, a population accounting for 40% of GDP. We're also seeing Chinese companies starting to delist from the New York Stock Exchange. And we're also seeing major US companies start to close down production in China and and look elsewhere. For example, Jeep has just announced that it will be closing its only factory in China due to uncontrolled changing political policies, getting involved in meddling with their business. Apple has also began to move manufacturing out of China and into Vietnam, following Samsung, Hasbro, and even Adidas. This also has been due to the aggressive zero tolerance policy, pandemic pressures. Uh, they have worsening demographics in regards to population. They have a shrinking labor force and are ranking in the middle in in regards to global income. In short, many of these companies are just leaving because it's more expensive in China than in other countries. This is causing companies to weigh out their options, many siding with moving their businesses to Vietnam or bringing businesses back to the US, as our labor prices might be more affordable than freight carrier prices for international shipping from China. We're also seeing construction of new manufacturing facilities in the US soaring 116% over the past year. Now there are massive chip factories finally being built in the US, specifically Phoenix, and Intel is even building two outside of the city. And there's also aluminum and steel plants being erected all across the South. Now, even though this might sound great for the US as more jobs are being added, cutting off ties with China still comes with its downsides. Remember, China and the US are each other's biggest trade partners. US companies exported $124 billion in goods to China in 2020, and we received almost 400 billion in imports from China as well. Now, if China's economy slows, so will its demand for US exports, such as commercial aircrafts, automobiles, and food, which means they don't need to buy it from us. This would also affect the US ability to create new debt. China is the second largest holder of US treasuries. And as China exports to the US decline, its government has fewer dollars on hand to purchase treasuries. The Chinese government gets these dollars from Chinese companies that receive them as payments for their exports. Now, less demand means the US treasury will have to promise higher interest rates when auctioning the notes. This puts upward pressure on the US interest rates because banks base their mortgage interest rates on the 10-year treasury yield, and higher interest rates might also prevent Congress from increasing federal spending that would then have an effect on slowing down the U.S. economic growth. And lastly, if China's demand for U.S. treasuries fall, so will the demand for the U.S. dollar. As the dollar loses value, prices for imports will start to go up, especially for necessities like oil and gas. Now, hopefully you guys know, but if not, oil and gas contracts must be made in U.S. dollars. Now, this is a topic called petrodollars, which is a whole other video that I could get into. But if the value of the dollar actually weakens, many countries could reduce production to increase the price to counter the dollar falling. So all in all, keep your eyes peeled on China's economy the next couple of weeks, because some pretty crazy things might actually start to happen. Now, as for protecting yourself, there's really not much you can do besides maybe diversifying your portfolio and not being too heavily weighted in a certain position or sector like international funds or Chinese funds or stuff like that. But with all of that being said, guys, I'll keep you guys updated on any new information I hear about China, as well as maybe some other ways of protecting your money. But with all that being said, definitely make sure to like the video for the YouTube algorithm, turn on post notifications, comment if you haven't already, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.